Welcome everybody um, to this uh, SEAC International Arbitration Webinar Series uh, and the second part of the SEAC Indian Council of Arbitration Webinar. Um, I hope all of you are safe and well in, in whichever jurisdiction and location you are. Um, and I hope we can start this Friday evening with a wonderful and rich discussion on what I think is, is a really fascinating topic um, and a topic that is going to become more and more relevant as we come out of this COVID pandemic uh, and perhaps see a flood of disputes arising out of it. Um, the topic, as, as, as everybody is aware, is arbitration in India, the way forward, perils and precautions in complex disputes, navigating multiple contracts, multiple parties, and multiple proceedings. Um, I think we have a, a panel that will have a range of legal issues that they have confronted as they have dealt with arbitrations with multiple parties or multiple proceedings. Uh, I hope also they'll have a range of, of wonderful anecdotes to tell us uh, when, when such issues arose in their offices and their practices. Uh, and I hope, like I said, it will be a stimulating discussion to set up a nice Friday evening leading on to a nice weekend uh, for all the attendees. Uh, in terms of the panel, although of course the topic is arbitration in India, I think uh, any practitioner of Indian arbitral disputes uh, realizes how international our disputes are uh, and how increasingly popular institutional arbitration is uh, and how much it's even been a focus of our government to try and promote institutional arbitration. Uh, so it only made sense to have a diverse panel that we have today uh, to help us walk through uh, the sheer diversity of issues. Um, going, going strictly in alphabetical order, uh, I wanted to introduce the panel to you. Uh, Mr. Kaitan is a senior partner at Kaitan and Company uh, based in Calcutta. Sanjeev Kapoor is, is also a partner at Kaitan and Company in the disputes practice, a very well regarded international arbitration lawyer, and I think a very well regarded court lawyer as well. Uh, he's based in Delhi. Um, Tejas Karia heads the international disputes practice at Shardul Amarchand Mangaldas, and again, he is based out of Delhi. Uh, for an international perspective, we've got Shenyi Theo, a senior counsel in Singapore, um, and Kabir Singh, a partner at Clifford Charles. Um, I think you're going to find uh, this panel really has a, a wide perspective on the issues that we're going to try and discuss today. In terms of the format, uh, I've tried to identify five broad issues uh, that I will put to each of the panelists. Uh, but the idea is to have a more freewheeling discussion. Uh, and so after a panelist addresses my questions or the issues I raise, uh, we're going to try and continue that discussion uh, across the other panelists. Uh, but most importantly, I think uh, webinars like this are, are well served by questions from those of you who are attending. Uh, and so we're going to keep a track of the questions uh, on the question and answer portal or, or, or screen that's opening up. Uh, and if you put your questions on that screen, uh, we will keep a track of them and we have allocated a significant time uh, towards the latter half of this hour and a, hour and a quarter session uh, for our panelists to address those questions. Um, just introducing the topic um, very, very briefly from, from my perspective. Um, you know, when I, when I see complex contracts, multiple parties or multiple agreements, uh, I often go back to uh, the initial days of my practice, which started out as a transactional lawyer. And I, and I try and ask myself, how did this situation come to be? What was happening uh, when these contracts were being negotiated? Were the lawyers thinking through uh, the various kinds of issues that can arise when there are multiple contracts across multiple parties? Um, to give you a, a small example from, from one of my first arbitrations, uh, it was an arbitration where there were three shareholders, uh, two Indian shareholders and one, one foreign party shareholder. And the arbitration clause or the disputes clause simply didn't contemplate that the two Indian parties could have a falling out. Uh, and so then when the dispute finally came, it was one Indian party against the other two shareholders. Uh, and the arbitration clause didn't really account for that kind of a situation. Um, when, I look at, when I look at this issue, I often think a, a multiple contract situation or multiple parties can raise disputes of such permutations and combinations that sometimes it's hard for transactional lawyers at the time of contract formation 
to think through how an arbitration clause may play out. And that may be part of the problem that, that we will start discussing today. Let me start, uh, Mr. Khaitan, with you. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you can tell us uh, something about the kind of issues that arise when there are multiple parties or multiple contracts. Uh, issues that I think we've already flagged in, in, the, in the flyer for this webinar uh, about delayed decision making or contradictory findings among different tribunals or inconsistent decisions, problems with enforcement, say. Uh, I'd love to get your initial comments on what you think are the issues that arise and perhaps a little bit on how those issues can be addressed up front when parties are actually entering into a contract. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I thought uh, I'll start with uh, my little anecdotes because uh, when I joined the profession in uh, early 1970, the arbitration law in India was not very robust. Uh, I remember that immediately after I joined my firm in the early 70s, uh, the first matter which I handled for the arbitration was for, I acted as a junior for my senior partner. And it was a division between a very large industrial house. Uh, they had a number of family members and uh, the dispute arose between them. And as I told you that since the arbitration law was not very robust, uh, institutional arbitration was practically unknown in India. Uh, you had few institutional arbitration in Europe and America, but as far as Asia was concerned and India was concerned, there was hardly any institutional arbitration. So most of the time it used to be ad hoc arbitration. So during those days when there used to be any disputes between the parties concerned and it used to be between the families and you know joint family, because most of the business were in joint families and the families were growing and they wanted to separate and they started to do their own business. So there were a few arbitration of large industrial houses uh, which our firm used to handle at that time. And normally what used to happen that, you know, the, uh, fa the, uh, the family member who wanted to uh, separate and they have a division of their family assets, they used to choose uh, some very prominent member of the community. And uh, that particular prominent member of the community could have been a very uh, well-reputed lawyer or he could have been a very large, a big industrialist, very reputed industrialist. And in most of the cases, they used to choose, uh, choose a very reputed industrialist. And what they normally used to do, that the, instead of, well, they used to say that the parties will not have the lawyers. Uh, it is the arbitrator who will appoint the lawyer to assist the arbitrator. I mean, it was, it was something very different that, you know, the arbitrator needed, because the industrialist, the, the industrialist was appointed as an arbitrator, he would not know much about the law. So he needed an he needed a lawyer to assist him, and the direction was to the parties that you will appear and you will make your presentation, but you will not be allowed to appear through a lawyer. And the other thing was that you know these awards you know could have been challenged and could have gone for years and years together. So what we used to do, we used to obtain signature of all the parties you know under a blank paper. It used to be like they said that the arbitrator would give a consent award. And all the parties have to agree to this consent award so that in future there is no dispute because none of the industries like, you know, who were the arbitrator, who were a big name, that their award would be challenged on various grounds because uh, their name would have been staked and if the award would have been set aside, their reputation would have been staked. So they were not interested. They were only interested to go for a consent award. So this is how the arbitration developed, you know, used to do the arbitration. But very interesting case happened when I joined Indian Council of Arbitration as a president. And then I came across a very peculiar case, uh, which was a case uh, where there were 384 cases. The claimant was uh, Food Corporation of India, and uh, there were rice millers, you know, they used to store rice, Food Corporation of India used to store rice with the rice millers. And uh, they, had a, they had an arbitration clause they said that it will be, the arbitration will be conducted by the Indian Council of Arbitration. But they have a different mode of appointment of arbitrators. That means it was in, it was in conflict with the appointment of arbitration, arbitrator, which was in terms of the Indian Council of Arbitration. So we said that it is in conflict with your appointment procedure is absolutely in conflict with our appointment procedure. And you said in accordance with the rules of the Indian Council of Arbitration. So until you give us a consent from both the sides, 
that you know they would uh, they abide by the rules of the Indian Council of Arbitration and will appoint arbitrators. None of there were uh, three eighty-four parties, and we did not appoint the arbitrator. And the dispute started in uh, nineteen ninety-eight, and ultimately it went up to the Supreme Court. And in two thousand three, the Supreme Court said very well. The Indian Council of Arbit the, uh, the arbitration would be within the aegis of the Indian Council of Arbitration, and the Indian Council of Arbitration would, in relation to each case, will appoint sole arbitrator. Now there were 384, and we were to appoint sole arbitrators in that. So this was again a question that whether we can go for a multi-party or not. But it's it goes further. It goes further that after this uh, order was made in 2003, the FCI deposited their administrative charges and the arbitrator's fees with the ICA. But the rice mill owners would not, would not deposit that amount. So we could not proceed with the arbitration until the, all the parties deposit the amount. And it took from 2003 to 2007. You know, ultimately the rice millers, 384 parties did not deposit the amount. It was the Food Corporation of India who deposited the amount. So from 2003 to 2007, the time went around in, a, in deposit of the money. Now after the after the money was deposited, this is a, this is a, this is again very interesting. After the money money was deposited, then the question arose that how do we appoint arbitrators? You know, have the multi party so that you know to arrange parties and <clears throat> so that you know we can have limit the number of arbitrators. Uh, to reduce the cost. This took a lot of time because to negotiate with 384 parties and things, uh, things like that. So that is how what I'm, what I'm trying to say that how we face the difficulty as far as the multi-party because there was no robust arbitration clause in relation to multi-party dispute because one party was Food Corporation of India. He had a supply to three, he had a contract with 384 parties who were doing only the storage part of it and it did not have a multi-party contract. So there were 384 arbitration. We had to combine some arbitration to 50 and 60. So I thought that you know this was one important area and one important case which I had to deal with uh, when, in, in, when I had to deal with as a president of the Indian Council of Arbitration. That's, as, that's, but in today's world, you know, it is very, very important to have uh, a robust clause in relation to multi-party disputes. No, that, that's... Uh, Way to start the discussion. It also sets a historical context where our arbitration come from. Um, and and you know, Kabir, if I if I could just turn to you, I think the, the two things I was thinking about when Mr. Kaitan was talking was was going back to his first example. Really, there was a consent of the parties uh, to this leading industrialist or mediator of some kind, um, and and consent is so very important in the absence of an arbitration agreement that takes care of the situation. Consent is so very important to be able to consolidate or combine arbitrations. Uh, and the other aspect that Mr. Kaitan also spoke about is ultimately some of this consolidation arose because of a court order. Uh, can, you, can you walk us through what in a multi-party situation is it? Is it often just down to getting consent of the parties to, to, to be on the same page? Or is there ways the arbitration agreement itself or the arbitration agreements themselves uh, can be made compatible and, and result in a streamlined uh, arbitral process? Thanks, Ritin. Um, yeah, no, I think your, your, your question is a good one and one that we've sort of often considered. Um, you started off the discussion by saying that quite often the problem sort of has its roots in the way that the arbitration agreements are actually drafted. Uh, and that the transactional lawyer, uh, as you used to be in your former life, uh, looks at an agreement um, and is not able to sort of contemplate the multiple ways in which complex disputes might arise, you know, the involvement of parties and the number of arbitrations that might actually be spawned from, from you know, one or more agreements that he's putting together. So I think that's, that, that I think is one of the key issues that I think needs to be talked about today, which is whether you can take away to some extent uh, the amount of uncertainty uh, and the amount of frustration that parties often experience uh, when they find that they haven't done a proper job at the beginning, uh, you know, either thinking about it or considering, uh, you know, and I, I mentioned, I remember Mr. Kaitan mentioned that, you know, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, I, I think you mentioned it wasn't, it wasn't contemplated that two of the Indian parties would be 
uh, going against each other. Now, again, you know, one can be forgiven for, for, for not considering that kind of situation. But so I think you, um, the point you raise is a good one. It's something which, uh, you know, transaction lawyers need to be, I suppose, educated about. Uh, and, and, you know, as their dispute colleagues, that that's one of the roles. But it's something which uh, can be tackled in a, in, in a couple of ways. So I think um, the, the first point that you made is, is consent. And I think that's the most straightforward way, right? So the easiest way is that if you could potentially make, um, you know, everything subject to one arbitration agreement or an identical arbitration agreement in that sense. And in, 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 in that way, you sort of remove quite a lot of the uncertainty. Uh, now, for sometimes, uh, you know, depending on the complexities of project, depending on nationalities of parties, where they are situated, you know, what their preferences are, what local law impositions might be on them, they're not able to do that. So uh, in, in, in those kinds of situations, we sort of go for, you know, a couple of other options. So for example, um, can the arbitration agreements in different contracts actually be coordinated in a sense such, such that at least uh, in the transactional documents, you know, they cross refer to each other or they cross refer to that sort of intention to have the disputes, uh, you know, sort of heard together. Um, parties also seeking to maximize the chances of consolidation or if you're talking about joinder, which is bringing another party into the arbitration, uh, should try and make sure that the arbitration agreements are also compatible, right? Uh, and so, for example, that's, uh, that would come about, for example, where you would want to think about using the same set of rules. So let's say if you, you know, it wouldn't help your case if you had one arbitration agreement under the ICC rules, one under the LCIA, one under the ICA, and one under the SIAC, because then whichever court or tribunal is looking at it is going to have one additional layer, uh, which is that, look, the parties deliberately chose another institution. Uh, and then that, that gives rise to its own, com you know, all complexities. Um, another option, again, I'm just throwing out ideas here, is what we've seen as an umbrella arbitration agreement. So you have one main arbitration agreement and then you have sub sort of categories down the line. Um, and I think what's happening now and, and what we see as, as a trend now, given that we work a lot with our transactional colleagues in this, um, is that, you know, parties are now being basically steered towards rules that already have pre-drafted um, arbitration and, you know, consolidation and joint provisions. Now, you know, this is an SIAC seminar uh, webinar. Obviously, you know, an SIAC rules is one of probably uh, the thought leaders in this area in terms of having a very robust, very well laid out set of consolidation procedures. So that's another way to do it, right? Which is that even if you don't want to contemplate it, by choosing an institutional rules that con already contains very clear, um, you know, uh, consolidation provisions, the criteria and joinder criteria, then, then that's, you know, another way of, of doing that. So I think, I think these are a couple of solutions uh, and approaches that I've seen, you know, working with, with clients in this area. Yeah, Kabir, I, I guess you, you do see some of it with your transactional colleagues, perhaps coming to you at the time uh, they're negotiating or, or finalizing contracts. Uh, Tejas, are you also seeing that more frequently done where your colleagues who have a transactional practice uh, come to the disputes team and, and spend more time on the arbitration clause, particularly when they're signing contracts uh, across multiple parties? Uh, you know, for example, in a shareholders agreement, the joint venture partner may be a particular entity domiciled in a particular jurisdiction for a tax reason, but, but the technology partner uh, might actually be in a different jurisdiction or the trademarks might be held by some different entity. Are you seeing more attention being paid to that kind of issue at the time of contract formation? Uh, thanks, Ritin. Yes, um, uh, definitely, because what has happened is that the experience has shown uh, to us that if you don't pay attention at the time of drafting, uh, we litigate more even before starting the actual arbitration uh, on the issue of consolidation. So it always helps to have a robust uh, uh, dispute resolution clause, which provides uh, for how to deal with a situation when the dispute arises between multiple parties. So envisaging various uh, permutation combination at the time of drafting of the contract uh, or the arbitration agreement itself uh, pays a, uh, in a long term because what happens is that if we have not seen that how many parties are there, what is the relationship, is there a back-to-back -back agreement? Kabi rightly pointed out about umbrella agreement. Uh, are you mirroring uh, the clauses in the contract? Are you incorporating by way of a reference? Do you really want to not consolidate? Because many a times we, we have had a situation where 
in the same contract or two separate contract there was a one shareholders agreement and other was an employment agreement purposefully in employment agreement we put mcia clause whereas in the shareholders agreement it was ciac clause and that was done with an intent and actually the dispute has arisen now and we are having a domestic uh, tribunal in delhi governed by mcia rules and uh, in singapore and the ciac rules and that is where we have an advantage because we are now dragging that uh, director who was an employee and, and also a shareholder uh, into different jurisdiction and he he was more likely to settle with us uh, when we acquired the company because that's something goes also uh, that thought has to be there at the time of drafting of the contract but what we see in majority of cases is that when the dispute comes to us uh, dispute lawyers is that it's not well thought through and mostly it is ad hoc arbitration in india we don't have provision for consolidation and that creates a lot of confusion at the time of section 11 when we have multiple parties in different contracts and the court appoint the same arbitrator but the same arbitrator is not able to uh, uh, pass a common award the, he passes separate awards and is in india we know they charge separate fees for the separate arbitration even though there is one hearing so we are paying thrice over the whole idea of consolidation is saving of cost and avoiding multiplicity of uh, award so in if we had one arbitration between the same three parties uh, same arbitrators in the same day there are two orders passed arbitration one they order and arbitration two they order and the double fees is charged so that should all be avoided and it's very easy it's very easy when we are drafting it uh, have a compatible uh, and i'll talk about it when we discuss further about how in cia uh, and 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 in a court how do we examine uh, consolidation request uh, is compatibility is is key because if parties have consented nothing like it but once a dispute arises nobody is going to consent secondly if you have not contemplated at the time of drafting at least before the dispute arise there should be proper amendment because we have seen that number of time during the term of the contract amending the contract to make it uh, compatible makes uh, a lot of difference when the dispute arise so with that uh, I, i feel that we have a lot of uh, um, scope uh, to envisage what kind of dispute will ar arise uh, where should be the seat between the parties and which rules it should govern and if you are an ad hoc also it's better to have an umbrella or a mirror uh, arbitration clause right yeah i know they just you're, you're quite right in making a very important point that not not always do we want to consolidate that, that might not serve our clients interests uh, and so consolidation doesn't is not automatic just because there is some similarity of the issues or some commonality of the parties um uh, i i will also come back to you tejas on on another point you were starting to make i think about whether you can consolidate in india an indian seated arbitration whether you can consolidate an international commercial arbitration with a non international commercial arbitration because the grounds of challenge for example are different but i think i want to come back come back to you on that in a while um what i do want to start with uh, shenyi if i may to you um because i think our indian law is is quite complicated in terms of its rules regarding consolidation or combining arbitral proceedings uh perhaps you could help us with with what kabir described as as one of the thought leaders ciac uh, in terms of how their rules work uh to enable consolidation where it is a more optimal method of dispute resolution um perhaps you could explain to us what exactly it means to say arbitration agreements are compatible um and i know it's a point we discussed uh, last week uh, where you said that you know institutions may also possibly be working together to make compatible arbitration agreements where there are different institutional arbitrations contemplated um so before we get into some of the indian law on this um can you tell us uh, your experience with the ciac rules and and how how you've seen them work well okay so you uh, hi hi um so what 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 happens with a lot of parties is they they either blunder into complexity or they uh, deliberately create complexity for themselves so they can game the system but the SIAC has quite a comprehensive set of rules we're not the only institution with a co uh, comprehensive set of rules the ICC also has rules on uh, consolidation joinders multiple contracts so for the SIAC we're really looking at rules 6 7 and 8 and rule 6 deals with multiple contracts 
Rule 7 deals with joinder and Rule 8 or uh, deals with consolidation. So very quickly, what essentially it means is for Rule 6, multiple contracts, you can file a notice of arbitration for each of these contracts. You can a separate notices of arbitration or one notice of arbitration. Uh, and it will be treated as, um, as, as starting separate arbitrations first. Obviously, this must mean everyone is under the SEAC rules. But that's the easy bit. The joinder bits are also quite interesting because obviously uh, you can join a party to an arbitration, a, a non-party to an arbitration if there is consent, right? Because contractual autonomy, everybody says yes. I mean, the joint, the party joining says yes, the party to the arbitration says yes, no issue. The next time, the, the other occasion where you can join somebody is if that party is also subject to the arbitration agreement. So you may have an arbitration agreement, like a subscription agreement or a joint venture agreement. So the joint venture, there may be five parties, but the arbitration started between two. So one party wants to join one of the other parties to the arbitration agreement. There shouldn't normally be an issue doing so. And that you can find the rules under rule seven. What is important to avoid is to avoid the temptation to say, well, we started an arbitration. There are these three other parties who are related parties and they are integral to the resolution of this dispute. And therefore we want to join them. And this is actually what happened in PT First Media in Singapore. And that ended terribly for the parties that, or the, the party that wanted to join the non uh, parties or non-signatories to the arbitration agreement. I mean, it, the, an arbitration was heard. There was actually no challenge on jurisdiction. There was no challenge. There was no setting aside. But when it came to enforcement, the Singapore court refused to enforce it. And I think this is a fairly, most courts would generally refuse to enforce it if there is a lack of fundamental jurisdiction. And if you're not a party to an arbitration agreement, there's a lack of fundamental jurisdiction. So the, coming, uh, coming to uh, rule eight, which is the rule on consolidation. Again, it's quite simple. If everybody agrees, that party can be consolidated. If the party is under the same arbitration agreement, then uh, uh, you, you can, it can be consolidated. But if, they, if it's a related case, but it's a different arbitration agreement, then you ask that question on compatibility. Is, are the arbitration agreements compatible? But let me just pause there for one moment and just digress slightly because I should point out that some different arbitral tribunals deal with it differently. So in Singapore or, or SIAC, when you want to consolidate and you haven't appointed the tribunal, you ask the court to consolidate and then the court will allow all parties to be heard. If the tribunal has already been appointed, then you ask the tribunal to consolidate. And this can only be done in certain circumstances because if you have three cases and three different tribunals have been started, then it's a little bit difficult. Usually you start one, you start one case with one tribunal and for the other two cases, no tribunals have been uh, um, appointed. And then it makes it easier to consolidate. But coming back to the point of compatibility, uh, I think Kabir mentioned it just now and, and I think uh, written, you asked me about it, so I'll, I'll jump to it. It's probably easier to consider it from the point of view as to what is not compatible. And because it's very clear, so if you have different arbitration agreements, somebody says one, so one says one arbitrator, one says three arbitrators, you can understand that that's very difficult to make it compatible because you're actually asking a party, you, you, a party could say, hey, wait a minute, I wanted this particular dispute, which is very complex, to be heard by three arbitrators, and I wanted a choice of my arbitrator, whereas in the other arbitration agreement, it's relatively simple, or I thought it was simple, or, and I only wanted it to be heard by one. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a deep incursion into party autonomy to then force parties to either have one or three. And what if they're, then what if there are different rules? That may not be a deal breaker, but I think it may make it quite difficult. So then sometimes what first in time prevails, uh, what if there are different administering in, uh, institutions or different languages or different seats? So all that, all these things, see, so it's quite easy to say it's not compatible. It's a little bit more challenging to say an arbitration agreement uh, is compatible. So ultimately, I think as uh, Mr. Kaitan said, 
sometimes it boils down to just getting parties to consent. But then we all know if parties are cooperative litigants or, or disputants, then they will consent. They are practical. But if parties want to be difficult, if they want to game the system, they may not want to consolidate. They, want, may, they may want to make it as difficult as possible for the other parties. So I've got a case where there was uh, one arbit uh, SI, SIAC, one arbitrator. Second arbitration was SIAC, three arbitrators. And the third one was ad hoc. But both lawyers are sensible. So we said, let's bring it all together, consolidate uh, one arbitrator. I've got another one where there's ICC, there's SIAC, and uh, I, or I, I, I'll just say I've heard of one where there's ICC and SIAC, where one party wants to be difficult and says, look, I don't care. I'm going to have four arbitrations. We're not going to consolidate because I'm going to make it bloody difficult for you. And it, it's just going to be, and, and that might make, and because I may have the advantage when it comes to either time or deep pockets, I will make it, uh, I'll incentivize you by making it procedurally difficult for you to come to a settlement. So maybe the simplest way is to say, if I've got different institutions, come to an agreement with the other side so uh, that you should appoint the same arbitrators. So you appoint the same arbitrators, you could have an ICC one in, in, in Mumbai, a SIAC one in Singapore, but if you appoint the same arbitrators and they all relate to the same facts, you could effectively have two arbitrations, but you can kind of sort of procedurally hear things once. Now, I, I don't know the issue of double fees. It's not culturally a uh, Singapore thing. I mean, we don't have, we don't get fees for, for, for not doing work <laughs> or, uh, uh, or, or for doing the same work, uh, what, uh, or for doing two bits or, or, hang on, for doing work once and getting paid twice. We don't have that. I think CF is not going to allow fees to be uh, paid to arbitrators on that basis. So, so I think that's a good plug for CF maybe. Uh, one last point written uh, before I, I let the, the rest of the panel talk uh, or, or hand it back. Remember, the SIC has a very interesting thing, and it's called the Memorandum Regarding Proposal on Cross-Institution Consolidation Protocol. It's a long, long memo, it based, uh, or a long, long title for basically saying institutions should come together. So when there are issues relating to um, consolidation proceedings and the arbitrations are in two different institutions, there is a protocol, a rule, a joint committee or some set of pre-agreed rules to determine which tribunal runs it with which rules. Maybe there might be some cost sharing or fee sharing, but, but I think the problem with this is then all institutions have to cooperate and it is in the interest of the, an institution to take as many arbitrations as possible because they are KPIs. So I, I guess this is, some, this is a conversation that one should keep open. It's there, uh, it's possible, and it, it, super, it, it, it obviates the need for consent of the parties. Now, I probably haven't answered your question, but I better let the rest of the panel have a chance to speak. Thank you, Ritin. No, I, th I think you have answered, answered my question, Shenyi. Thank you. I think, I think it's a very good way to look at it also, to look at what agreements are not compatible. Uh, and then try and think through the answer of what agreements are. Um, and I also like the way you, you, you know, you've put it that uh, sometimes parties blunder into complexity uh, and sometimes they try to game the system. Um, maybe, maybe I'll go to Kabir with that thought, Kabir. Uh, when you've got a party opposite you, uh, perhaps trying to game the system, would you as, as counsel uh, push for an aggressive interpretation of compatibility of agreements and still try and use these rules to consolidate? Or, or would you think that the, uh, that the more prudent recourse would be to run a more expensive arbitration, or multiple arbitrations, because long term that might be uh, better for the client? Uh, or would you try and push to consolidate, uh, leaving certain questions later to be answered uh, if the party gaming the system was to challenge that consolidated award? Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's a good question. And, and again, written, I mean, um, it's one of those questions which you can only answer when you're faced with that particular situation because the considerations are just going to be multiple, right? I mean, um, you could have a situation where you know that this arbitration is not going to see the end, right? So you're starting an arbitration because commercially, uh, you know it's going to put enough pressure on the other side such that if you get through the first three or four months, uh, you know, they're going to come to the table to settle. So in that kind of situation, uh, yes, I would push for an aggressive interpretation, more likely. 
Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, I'm in a sense protected against enforcement um, at, at one, one level. So I know that if I am able to drag him kicking and screaming into a tribunal that he doesn't like, uh, and he thinks he's going to be as part of a process, he's more likely to come back to the negotiating table. Uh, if on the other side, uh, I know this person has got deep pockets and he's going to be willing to take the fight through to the end. Uh, and again, Shani mentioned the Astro Lipo case, which is one of those between two titans, right, on, on either side, uh, both very deep pockets, both willing to throw whatever there was needed to, to, to sort of fight the case. Uh, then perhaps I might be more uh, you know, uh, conscious about the fact that, yes, um, I may win the battle, but I may end up losing the war because I may get uh, a small victory up front. I may get my award quicker, but then I expose my award to sort of, you know, a setting aside. And in that situation, also, it depends on where you're going to enforce, right? If your enforcement is going to be in a less arbitration friendly jurisdiction where you know that the courts are going to be picking up on issues like this, uh, and going to be saying that, look, you know, this is the basis for me to, uh, you know, set aside the award or refuse enforcement, then again, you might take a different approach. I think it's, it's very fact specific. Um, and you'll need to be conscious because I, I, I think, as you rightly point out, the big concern is that um, while, yes, you might be able to get yourself within one arbitration, the, the multiple problems that it might create all the way uh, might not be worth that effort. And, and so you, you need to balance it. But I'd be happy to hear about the Indian perspective because it's interesting given that you guys have a lot of different arbitral institutions in India, uh, all vying for a part of a very big pie. So uh, Ritin, I'm sure you're gonna sort of deal with that in, in the questions. No, I will. And, and, and Kabir, there's a reason I'm the moderator because I think Sanjeev <laughs> and Tejas have, have all the knowledge on this. I'm gonna go to this <laughs> uh, and ask you Sanjeev, uh, you know, compared to compared to rules six, seven, and eight of the SEAC rules, um, I know the ICA, for example, doesn't have specific rules on consolidation, and and most of the cases that we see on consolidation come about by a by a court doing it. Um, you know, typically in a section eleven proceeding, uh, but but even in other contexts. Um, I'd like you to sort of uh, tell us. I mean, do you, do you think time is there for for Indian institutions to have clearer rules on consolidation? Or is it best that actually these issues come up before a court and a court is able to take a view about how interlinked or intertwined agreements are and therefore to be able to almost push parties into arbitration, even absent, uh, even absent an arbitration agreement uh, or consent by a party. Uh, could you navigate for us you know, the Indian case law uh, on, on how, how we moved on this issue? Uh, yeah, thank you, Ritin. Yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting in, in that sense, because most of the law in India on consolidation and rejoinder would be kind of what you say, judgment law. Uh, uh, judges uh, would look at the provisions of the Arbitration and Consolidation Act, uh, because obviously there's no provision which says joinder or consolidation as far as law is concerned. But they kind of try and widely interpret other expressions which are there in uh, Arbitration and Consolidation Act. So, uh, like, they will look at the definition of uh, a person claiming through or under him. And then they'll say, what is the meaning of a person claiming through or under him? Or Section 35 says that an award is final on the parties claiming under them. And these are the kind of interpretations onto which the court goes and that thereafter decides on the issues of joinder and consolidation of the party. So though the act is silent and act really doesn't uh, uh, really say anything about joint or consolidation of party. I would say why an interpretative provision and because the need was there in section 11 and section 45 and section 8 proceedings, courts have come out with these kind of criteria on the basis of which they are saying that uh, what would be a joint or party, what would be consolidation uh, of party. Uh, so uh, in a very famous case called chloro control has defined the expression uh, as to what person claiming through or under him would mean. And uh, the court held that this uh, would mean and take within its ambit multitude uh, of uh, multiple as well as multi-party agreements also. And the expression was held to allow even a non-signatory to some of the agreements to be referred to arbitration, provided they satisfied some uh, kind of a strict uh, prerequisites. And those strict prerequisites would be very, very common to, let's say, what the institutional rules are. Uh, so it's, it's, it's wide interpretation of the code. And there's 
kind of a huge, uh, uh, it's not really clear kind of a law in that particular sense because it depends upon the facts and circumstances, it depends upon uh, the perception of the judge. And many sim same cases we have seen that in some cases consolidation has been allowed but uh, many similarly situated uh, referring on the same pro uh, provisions, uh, the consolidation has not been allow allowed. So, uh, uh, so, so that has been there. I'll, I'll just give you one uh, uh, example where in the consolidated cases, uh, and it's a Supreme Court case called Amit Lal, in which uh, uh, the Supreme Court did actually refer the parties to a consolidated arbitration under the terms of four interconnected agreements where not all the parties were parties to the agreement. And in fact, one of the agreement did not even contain an arbitration clause. But the court said that uh, all the agreements were interconnected and related to a single project, which was commissioning of uh, some solar power plant. And therefore, they said that uh, there has to be a consolidation. Uh, very uh, uh, varying kind of a situation being taken by court in uh, one case, which was under the uh, Bombay Stock Exchange rules, wherein uh, a person has arbitration against uh, two other persons. Uh, uh, let's say a person had an arbitration against B and a separate arbitration agreement against C. And the court in that kind of a case uh, allowed uh, him to consolidate uh, both the claims against the, uh, uh, against uh, into, into one single arbitration because they said to deny the benefit of a single arbitration would lead to multiplicity of proceedings. But then, uh, on the other hand, we have a Dodge Postman case, wherein the situation was not same, but quite similar, wherein the court did not allow uh, this kind of a consolidation. So I think it has been varying. Uh, 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 so I would say, and, and you raised the question, what happens, let's say, a similar kind of a contract in which uh, uh, one of the parties is a, a domestic arbitration and another party agrees for an arbitration which is international commercial uh, arbitration. What happens in cases like those? And those are the cases which uh, went up to the Supreme Court. In fact, uh, there was a case uh, of uh, 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 Gangavaram Court uh, in, in which particular case uh, there were disputes which arose between the parties. Uh, and in that particular case, Supreme Court refused to consolidate the arbitration, which virtually arose out of uh, four or five contracts uh, and some corporate guarantee uh, that were all entered pursuant to a common tender. Uh, but they held that the intention of the parties to was to enter into distinct contract uh, because there was a mix of domestic as well as international arbitrations, uh, and therefore a composite reference of the disputes will not be proper. But to note. Uh, point which Shinya made, uh, the court in that particular case went on to uh, appoint single arbitral tribunal for all, this, uh, all, the, all the six uh, arbitrators. So there was six arbitration before the same tribunal, four of them domestic and I think two of them. Uh, uh, so I think these are the ways in which uh, uh, courts have tried to deal with it, but they are borrowing uh, from, uh, as I said, expressions which are there in the other part of the act. So it would really help that in case institutional rules in India are much more clear and much more specific, let's say like a CAC, ICC. Um, uh, to say Indian arbitral tribunal really don't have rules that might not be correct because uh, uh, under Indian Council of Arbitration, we have got rule 12.6 of ICA rules, which allows consolidation, but it allows consolidation before the same tribunal. Uh, so, so, uh, but but having robust and detailed rules uh, would would certainly certainly and definitely definitely be very very useful and helpful. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Mr. Kairan, if I could take that to you, I think the, the consensus seems to be that institutional arbitration can better accommodate these kinds of situations. Uh, would you also would you also agree that they lead to better or clearer outcomes uh, as opposed to an ad hoc arbitration? Mr. Katan, you're on mute. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, uh, uh, as far as the Indian law, Indian law is concerned, you know, the, the act is basically silent on the consolidation. Uh, uh, most of the, uh, in India, most in relation to the multi-party contract, in relation to the consolidation, in relation to 
the parties who are not parties to the arbitration agreement and you want all these parties to be referred to arbitration under a single arbitration all these things have happened through the medium of uh, courts you know uh, the courts have passed uh, recently uh, and this was unknown in india i mean basically as as early as in 2003 in a sukunya judgment you know a person who was not a party to the arbitration agreement the supreme court refused to refer the party to arbitration because he is not a party to the arbitration agreement but the things have changed there after a number of judgments of the supreme court has come where they say that if there are multiple multiple agreements even if there is a person is not a party to the arbitration agreement you know uh, if it is a composite agreement as it said it's an umbrella agreement and every every each agreement is compatible and they are related to each other then all the parties were referred to arbitration and there is not one but several judgments now so therefore how do we take care of that the ad hoc the arbitrators have left no jurisdiction to to consolidate or you know joinder of parties so therefore it is only the institution if there clause provides for joinder of parties there were robust clause for joinder of parties if there robust clause for consolidation then of course this is there is a possibility that this branch of law could also develop because unfortunately in india it was unknown you know uh, uh, the multi party multi party arbitration agreement consolidation joinder of parties persons who are not parties to the arbitration agreement whether they can all be clubbed together and the arbitration can go on now this law has recently developed uh, and the courts have taken very positive approach to the to this particular branch because they have become the courts have become more arbitration arbitration friendly so i think the only a uh, role is to have a robust institutional arbitration but unfortunately in india you know as far as the courts were concerned they were only uh, stressing upon the ad hoc arbitration that was an unfortunate part in india but now that the law has changed and you know institutional arbitration has got prominence so the new law provides for that the courts will also appoint an institution to conduct arbitration so i think uh, all the institution will now i think have to look into their Uh, rules and regulation, and uh, maybe you know f- uh, follow some rules and regulation which you have in in CAC and ICC in relation to multi-party contract, joinder of parties, and uh, consolidation of cases. I think it needs to be further incorporated in the rules which are in India. Yeah. Um, they just if I if I really to respond to what Sanjeev said and and to what Dan said, um, and and maybe. wearing both your hats uh, tejas as an indian lawyer it it looks like the uh, the the end result of, of whether an arbitration comes to be consolidated or even a combined arbitration is held before the same common tribunal uh, that end result depends a lot on the process one follows uh, perhaps on which party has moved which dispute first under which arbitration agreement um, and so maybe maybe you could give us some thoughts on how important it is in this context for a party to maybe invoke arbitration first uh, and and then to a point that uh, i think i think shenyi touched on at, at the very beginning that uh, under the ciac rules uh, consolidation is an issue that can be decided either by the court uh, and i know you sit on the court uh, or by the tribunal uh, do you have have some you know thoughts on on what is the more optimal way or or is, or does it depend on the facts of each case as to whether that determination should be made Uh, by the court or by the arbitral tribunal itself sure uh, so uh, as far as indian scenario is concerned uh, of course uh, when you have multi party contracts and you want to take an advantage of consolidation uh, it is very important for parties to uh, realize the first mover advantage so whoever moves first may get the advantage of being a claimant and also decide who should be the parties to that uh, proceeding so if you want to join party say uh, in one case we joined the parent company who was the real entity who had intended to enter the contract but the dummy company was uh, set up in india and it was a domestic arbitration but we joined the parent company so that we can at least get an interim relief uh, under section 9 and then uh, refer the matter to arbitration of course they will come and object uh, to that Uh, but uh, if you have multiple contracts or you have sub contractors who who may also have a back to back contract and and you are actually a middle person or a public sector undertaking where you have the government on one side and a contractor on the other side but you are sandwiched between the two and you have two separate contract 
and the dispute resolution clause is not uh, compatible so the real issue is that is the subject matter is the same is it a same commercial transaction uh, is is there a single economic interest and the courts have seen this factors to consolidate uh, the arbitrations or at least appoint a common arbitrator to decide multiple disputes so that there is no multiplicity of the proceedings and at least there is no contradictory judgments or award uh, which can come out, out, out of the same set of facts or the same set of evidence uh, which uh, may be led before the tribunals uh, so having a common set of arbitrators would really help if the subject matter is the same and uh, what is going to uh, happen is that you are essentially saving time and cost and that is the advantage of arbitration rather than going to uh, court and file multiple suits we have also seen that some parties go to uh, uh, court and file a suit because they they uh, join parties who are not party to the arbitration agreement and that's where we amended section 8 uh, specifically to plug this loophole Uh, of joining uh, parties who are not party to the arbitrations but necessary for for dispute so that is also now been plugged by uh, adding the language that anybody who is claiming through or under that main party then they would also be bound uh, the supreme court has also recognized in the case of cheran properties versus kasturi sons is that if you have a common economic interest uh, and you have a signatory and the non signatories would be presumed to be bound Uh, by the uh, action of the non -sign uh, signatories to the arbitration agreement and coming to uh, cr court uh, i uh, have seen number of cases where we have seen both the arguments because by the time the uh, request comes to us we have the reply uh, also from the other side and we need to find the hook to at least consolidate because that's the objective is not to always reject the consolidation but to find a way to see that if there is a possibility of consolidation if there is a case made out and there are three factors which are very important uh, in the cr rule if you see 8.1 uh, of course if the parties have agreed nothing like it but if there is a, a party who is objecting uh, to the consolidation first and foremost thing we see is is there a compatibility and going forward we see if the disputes arise out of the same legal relationship so same legal relationship is very important uh, for consolidation or the dispute arise out of the contract consistent of a principal contract and ancillary contract and the third which is very important and we try to kind of rely on that uh, in number of cases is that dispute arise out of the same transaction or series of transaction so when you have a dispute which is arising out of the same transaction or series of transaction even uh, though uh, the, there is no identical clause or one uh, contract has the cr clause and the other doesn't still we ensure that um, there is a consolidation because the whole idea is to avoid the parties from going to two different uh, dispute resolution mechanisms and fighting the same battle twice over so that's the idea but unfortunately we are bound by the rules and if the parties have not drafted the contract properly uh, we even though we wish to consolidate we cannot unless and until there is a real uh, facts which are falling within this four uh, three or four parameters which we are there so the intent is always to consolidate but it a lot uh, depends on the drafting of the uh, contract and the facts uh, of each case uh, but uh, we see that we sometimes wish that this uh, 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 arbitrations could have been consolidated but we are unfortunately not able to do that uh, and and that something uh, it, it depends on the parties uh, some parties draft contract purposefully not to consolidate but i personally feel that there should be a uh, a uh, idea behind drafting is to ensure that the uh, contracts uh, or the arbitrations at least are uh, in a cohesive way so that there is at least uh, a meaningful dispute resolution and uh, that's the aim uh, when we sit as as uh, members of cr court yeah uh, sanjeev if i may if i may uh, take take this question back to you uh, you know tejas of course used uh, two interesting concepts about a single economic transaction um, versus legal relationship uh, and and perhaps indian law goes also towards economic transaction and and goes beyond legal relationships in some way 
Uh, I want to also ask you a question that I see uh, Mr. Hiru Advani has, has put up. Um, and his question is, what about employer, contractor, and subcontractor joining in a common arbitration if both contracts have separate arbitration agreements but are independent on each other for a final result? Um, and, and actually, uh, I, I came across a, a similar situation where uh, the employer had sued its contractor uh, and the contractor filed an application before the arbitral tribunal saying that, look, my defense to this claim is that my subcontractor was delayed. And so please implead my subcontractor in this dispute. And the tribunal rightly said it didn't know any provision of law under which it could implead the subcontractor. Uh, the, the contractor then filed a 227 petition in the high court and the high court implied the subcontractor. Uh, the matter is now pending in the Supreme Court. Uh, but, but can you perhaps answer whether in that kind of fact pattern, uh, you think the courts can stretch consolidation and bring both the dispute between the employer and contractor and the contractor and subcontractor uh, into one arbitration? Uh, and, and would that be, uh, what basis would that be on? I mean, I, I think there are clearly separate legal relationships. Uh, and I think it's hard also to describe them as a series of transactions. Uh, but, but I'd like your thoughts on legal relationship versus economic transaction. Yeah, I, I, I would say that merely because it is, it is a, a part of, let's say, a larger economic transaction and uh, there is some kind of a commonality of parties. I think Indian law, under Indian law, as has been uh, by the, uh, held by the courts, might not be good enough. Uh, I think you have to go uh, somewhere uh, beyond that. Uh, and it would depend upon the facts and circumstances of the case. But uh, there, a very, very kind of a similar case, uh, which was there before the Supreme Court, and I think I earlier also referred to it, was the Deutsche Post Bank uh, home finance case, wherein there were two contracts, uh, one uh, uh, which arose out of a uh, loan agreement, which was there between a bank and a, a developer, uh, and the person who has taken the loan. And then there was a loan agreement, uh, a, a pursuant to that loan agreement, there was a development agreement under which the persons who have taken the loan gave it back to the person to develop the property. Very similar kind of a commonality uh, running all through, etc. But in that kind of a case, also Supreme Court held that this is not a case which needs to be consolidated. They said that this is a case uh, where in uh, 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 merely because there is some element of a commonality, but in case the, the uh, transactions are entirely, entirely different, we are not going to really consolidate those cases. And if my memory serves me right, I think High Court had consolidated it and Supreme Court uh, really uh, said that that kind of consolidation is not good. So I would say that merely because a few boxes are being ticked uh, that uh, some in substance the, uh, the, the, the parties are uh, uh, similar, or uh, there are the contracts which are in some way kind of connected uh, or, or referred to in each other, etc. And there is some, at some level, both the transactions are meeting, might not really, really be uh, uh, the sole criteria. I think uh, under Indian law, as is uh, presently existing, uh, you would need uh, something which is more than that. And I think that's, that's where the institutional rules would come and help you. And uh, that, that, that's the case where in that uh, stock exchange case, uh, I think one of the reasons they were able to consolidate two different contracts against two different persons was because uh, they drew strength from the Bombay Stock Exchange rules and said that those kind of rules will, will make it permissible for those kind of uh, uh, clauses, uh, those kind of arbitrations to be consolidated. So I would say you would need something more uh, than merely the commonality of the parties and uh, some overlap between the transactions for the contracts to be consolidated. That would, uh, that would be my reading of Indian law. But obviously, uh, there would be cases where in, uh, they would have been found to be composite in nature and very integrated and integral to each other. Uh, and therefore, multiplicity of the proceedings to be avoided, etc. might go in those kind of cases. But uh, they, they, they obviously, an additional Owners or a burden which, 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 which needs to be discharged, uh, just more than common yeah. of parties. Yeah. 
Thanks, Ajit. Uh, taking this back to you, Kabir, uh, now, now that you've uh, listened also to some of the complexities of Indian law, uh, I mean, I, I haven't been able to answer this question with clarity. Uh, when SEAC talks of arbitration agreements being compatible, what law are they going to apply to determine whether arbitration agreements are compatible? Uh, because I think Indian law or Indian courts seem to take a broader view of, of how arbitrations can be consolidated or arbitration agreements in that sense are compatible. So, so when SEAC is looking at this, what law will it apply, uh, especially if you have agreements which have different governing laws also? Um, and, and, and maybe one more uh, question which, which you could perhaps address. Uh, if I heard Tejas right, I think he said it, it is possible in SEAC uh, to consolidate an arbitration that is governed by SEAC rules with one that is not. And, and maybe I heard they just wrong, uh, but I'd like to discuss that point. Is, is consolidation under SEAC rules limited to arbitration agreements, all of which are governed by SEAC rules? Or, or can SEAC possibly consolidate arbitration agreements across, uh, let's say, an ad hoc arbitration and an institutional arbitration governed by SEAC rules? Um. Richin, sorry, just maybe taking your second question first. Um, my sense, uh, having read the provisions, is that it says uh, the power is to consolidate two or more arbitrations pending under these rules. Um, uh, Tejas, un unless um, you had a different idea of that, that, that was my reading of, of how those provisions work. And again, that's in a sense, I think, consistent with the fact that they're looking at consolidation or arbitrations that, that are sort of compatible. I think if you're looking at consolidating um, arbitrations that are governed by different institutional rules, then you get to the um, point that I think Shenny was talking about, which was the, I think the protocol that was put forward sometime in 2018, um, which I understand is, is still, I suppose, being considered, but I think many of us were involved in some of the feedback towards that, which was uh, cross-institutional consolidation about whether or not there would be, in a sense, a common body uh, you know, of a joint committee of sorts that was going to be able to consolidate arbitrations under different rules. Uh, and again, as, as I think Shenyi well said, uh, it's a process potentially fraught with quite a number of difficulties given the competing interests, uh, not only between parties, but also between the arbitral institutions uh, for, for that piece of the pie. Uh, so that, that's an interesting one. Uh, just going back to your question on, on the applicable law. And again, I think this is an interesting one uh, and very much like one of those where you have a look at what the, the law of the arbitration agreement is, I think you, you fall back on really two main kinds of laws that you'll be looking at. One is the law of the seat um, in that sense, and that is clear, uh, being you know, obviously relevant given that you know, that typically would govern issues of procedure and the procedural law. And so one would have thought that that, that would be a, a useful starting point. Uh, in, in some way, I think one also probably cannot ignore the substantive law of the agreement. Um, right. I mean, you know, if parties have, for example, entered into a full suite of Indian law governed documents, I would be surprised if no, uh, you know, value or recourse was put towards Indian law in that situation. So I think these are the questions. And But at the end of the day, I think when looking at sort of compatibility, they've ultimately taken a pretty practical approach to these things. I think arbitration clauses, uh, you know, will be compatible unless there's something really that renders them incompatible. And I think uh, Shani very helpfully sort of ran through some of those scenarios where, you know, we, we know that, you know, those will ultimately lead to disaster. And so uh, tribunals and, and institutions have stayed away, uh, you know, from, from, from uh, you know, using that kind of an approach. Uh, if I could just jump in here as well. I, I think that it might, <clears throat> like, Kabir makes a fair point because he talks about this, uh, he talks about arbitrations pending under these rules. So the implicit in that is that if you have two or more SIC arbitrations, you apply to consolidate them. I think that if you had an ad hoc arbitration with no rules, it might be possible to do that. And I think if parties consent, it wouldn't be an issue. Where you would have an issue is if one arbitration is SIAC, the other arbitration is ICC, and yeah. the party in the ICC arbitration is objecting. If that's the case, then that's going to be a problem because even if you did consolidate them, you're just kicking the can down the road. And what happens is that there will be a model law challenge to that because it isn't under yeah. the rules that you, or procedure that you would agree. So, so, so you've got that problem uh, as far as that's concerned. As far as the law is concerned, I, I think I agree with Kabir that actually the SIC, because it sets out a contractual framework 
or in terms of its, uh, by, by way of its rules, they, they will tend to apply that framework as maybe as strictly as possible and not try to import uh, uh, concepts uh, from the law of the seat or, or, or any particular governing law, uh, which may not be consistent with what is that say in, in, in rule 8.7, which is the, the, the governing rule. Um, uh, but but I, I thought I, I, there was some, one point that was made where other parties are brought in, in Singapore, at least the, the courts have dealt with it by if, if you have a case where you have two parties to an agreement, but then the claimant usually says, oh, oh there's a conspiracy with five other parties who are not parties to the agreement, they start in court. But what happens sometimes is that the case is stayed, the case goes against the, the two parties argue their case out in an arbitration, the rest of the parties have their case stayed. And they have to wait to the outcome of the arbitration. And this stay is known as a, uh, I think it's a procedural or an administrative stay. Uh, but sometimes what happens is parties to the, uh, uh, the non-parties to the arbitration then say, well, I might as well go and fight it out in the arbitration. It's private uh, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll do it that way instead. And I'll be bound by that result. So you might get a post-dispute consent. But I mean, I, I just thought I'd add that because there was some yep. talk about uh, non-parties to arbitration agreements, and that's how it's been dealt with practically. Yeah, if I may just add to uh, what uh, both Kabir and uh, Shani said about the SIAC rules, is that uh, it is explicit that it has to be a both SIAC arbitration because 8.2a says uh, the application of consolidation would provide for case reference number of, uh, of the arbitration sought to be consolidated. So therefore, it has to be pending uh, under the SIAC rules. It could be that the parties uh, post arbitration uh, uh, of one uh, refer it to SIAC uh, and be bound by the SIAC rules, but it has to be pending before SIAC. At least the court cannot uh, decide the application if the both arbitrations are not pending before SIAC. Correct. That's right. Yep. I, I stand corrected. That that's correct. They, they both must be uh, SIAC arbitrations, which is therefore broader than a chloro control type of principle. Where, where a court, if it finds a SIAC arbitration clause in, let's say, an umbrella agreement, may be able to persuade all the parties to go in that one, one SIAC arbitration. Um, and and therefore, therefore, the Indian courts are, are stretching the concept of consolidation a bit more than, than sometimes the rules might. Um, Mr. Kanan, if I, if I could take uh, some of those, those questions to you, I think uh, that, that that must be a requirement, I would assume, of institutional rules that all the arbitrations it seeks to consolidate uh, must be governed by arbitration of that institution itself. I don't think an institution could uh, consolidate uh, arbitrations that arise out of arbitration agreements which are not governed by that institutional rule. It's true because uh, if the institution, if, if you go for an arbitration under the institutional rule, then actually the parties has to say that, you know, our arbitration would be governed by this particular institution rule. So you have to be governed by that particular institution rule. But, you know, as, uh, as they rightly said that, you know, nowadays the consolidation, joinder, all these issues, you know, is uh, in Indian courts are taking a very proactive approach into that. And this law has really developed in recent years. And everybody wants, you know, that either it's an arbitral tribunal or it is the court. Everybody sees that, you know, there should be a uh, time-bound arbitration. The arbitration should be finished within a particular point of time, uh, less of cost. Because the, the, what is the purpose of arbitration? The motto of arbitration is that your disputes are resolved in a cost-effective, in a timely manner. Otherwise, why arbitration? Why alternative dispute resolution? The whole purpose of alternative dispute resolution is a timely resolving the dispute time resolution of dispute in a timely manner and in a cost effective manner and the you can only achieve this in relation to a multi party contract in relation to gender of parties that all the arbitrations are clubbed together there is a single arbitration and the arbitrator decides the dispute between the parties under one common arbitration so therefore the institution rules become very very important but at the same time you know as far as uh, you know we uh, my friend referred to a particular case where, the, where the, even in an ad hoc arbitration, the court can refer to, you know, the court can in an ad hoc arbitration, the court can consolidate the arbitration if it goes to the court. If it goes to the court. The, there are case laws which say that in relation to an ad hoc arbitration, the court has the power to consolidate arbitration. So therefore, the whole stress has been that, you know, 
uh, resolve the if there is a multi party contract if there are two, if there are multi uh, multi party contract and there are multi party arbitration agreement consolidate all of them have it under our our arbitration may we be under the arbitration rule or may we through the medium of the court and today the tribunal have an approach towards achieving that object and when the courts have a good, uh, have an uh, object what achieving that object and Ritin, I just may add one sentence to that. Uh, uh, see, unlike institutional rules where obviously you clearly have got rules where, where arbitrations can be consolidated, etc. Indian courts have actually tried to apply various legal bases, which might uh, be the basis which can be applied to bind a non-signatory to an arbitration. Um, so the concepts like an implied consent doctrine of group companies in Charon case, which they just mentioned, agent principal relationship, uh, apparent authority theory, succession. So I think these are the uh, principles as the Indian law says, Indian court say, uh, which are not merely dependent upon party's intention or consent, but in some exceptional cases, as the force of the applicable law, under which the non-signatories can also be joined as parties to the arbitration. Yeah, you're right. Let, let me let me close with with one quick fire question to to all all the panelists. Maybe just a minute, if, if each of you have to answer this. It's a question that also comes to us from Vinod Nakra. Uh, he says, given the complexity involved in referring cases involving multi-party arbitrations, is it not possible to frame model arbitration agreements for domestic and international com contracts? Um, and it, and it goes to something which I just heard on a, on a webinar. I think just last week. Uh, where, where someone was asked, how do you draft an arbitration agreement? And the answer was, uh, the answer is KISS. Keep it simple, silly. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, going back to something I think Kabir said at the beginning of this webinar, um, is it best in multi-party contracts that, that all parties sign on to a common, simple arbitration agreement? Is that, is that the best way to ensure that once a dispute arises, and again, we don't know when signing a contract what kinds of disputes will arise, under what agreements they will arise, between what parties they will arise. Uh, is it best to have a simple arbitration agreement to which all these parties across these various uh, contracts uh, conform or, or sign on to? Uh, let me just, you know, a minute, minute and a half, please. Uh, let me take it starting from Mr. Kaitan. Yeah, you see, it depends upon, suppose there is a uh, multi-party contract and there are different contracts. Then how do you do under a one simple contract? That means that you have to enter into a separate arbitration agreement. So the issue will be that each arbitration, it depends upon the facts of the each case, that whether it is a consolidated case or not, it is a composite case or not, as uh, you know, the Sanjeev was saying that, you know, how do you consolidate, how do you do the joinder of parties? The question was that, you know, whether there's a principal agent relationship or not, whether there is a there is a succession, whether you are lifting of the corporate bill. So of course I agree that it has to be a simple agreement. If there is a simple agreement, you know the interpretation is much simpler. If it is <laughs> if it is not a simple agreement, it can have a very different interpretation. So it is always better to have a simple simple arbitration clause. There is no doubt about it. But what happens if there are uh, many contracts? Yeah, and multiple parties. Then you can't have a single agreement. You have to have different agreements. And all agreements, it will depend upon the facts of the each case whether it can be combined together or not. Shenyi, may I have your thoughts on that question? Yes, I, I mean uh, two points. One, uh, make sure if if there are multiple contracts. Uh, with multiple parties and usually it all relates to the same thing. Just make sure you have the same arbitration clause. So same institution, same rules, same seat, same number of arbitrators. I think that's probably the best way to keep it simple. Although the clause itself might not necessarily be, be simple. It can be quite complex, but it must be the same. The second best solution have the same, uh, everybody agrees in whatever dispute we have, we have the same arbitrator or arbitrators because somehow you have three arbitrators managing different things in different seats, they can still kind of procedurally bring things together. So, but, but that's a poor second. Uh, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, Tejas, two simple solutions from Shen Yi. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we, we have to keep it simple. The other option is to have uh, arbitration agreement in only one contract and then uh, refer to that contract. 
saying that 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 clause will apply to this arbitration agreement is, uh, or the dispute resolution mechanism will apply to this contract as well. So that saves uh, a lot of effort in interpretation. Uh, second is also having a model clause always helps. So rather than uh, reinventing the wheel every time, uh, if the institutions can have a model clause, which can be then bodily lifted and put it in the agreement, and that could be referred uh, by way of uh, incorporated by way of reference uh, in the other uh, uh, agreement. So those are the things which should keep it uh, in mind. But identical clauses helps a lot. And having a common seat also helps a lot because, as you know, uh, in a foreign seated arbitration, the, uh, the Indian law uh, is different in terms of the challenge is concerned. You have to challenge it at the place of the seat. Indian uh, part one will not apply to the foreign seated arbitrations other than uh, interim relief and, and uh, uh, evidence uh, powers given to the court. So that way uh, is also very important to have the common seat. Uh, even two Indian parties can have seat outside India and, and uh, international commercial arbitration can have seat in India. But if we really want to consolidate that, uh, it is always good to have the common seat. Kabir, may I take that to you with, with your experience of, of arbitrations arising out of India, common seat, and, and your preference would be that seat might be seated outside India? That, that's right. I think, um, I, I think the first key point is mentioned already is to keep it simple and consistent. I think that's the biggest challenge because when parties draft different contracts, they somehow like to draft different arbitration agreements, uh, which, which, which tends to start the complication. Um, I think a close second to that, in my view, is that um, you fall back on the institution. So if you're going to a institutional arbitration, then just make sure you're choosing an institution which in and of itself in its rules already contains clear consolidation and joinder criteria. Uh, and that's what we do to our clients. We say, look, don't mess around with the clause. Just choose a straightforward institutional clause, but go to a reputed institution. So if you need consolidation, then these are the criteria that are already there. So don't mess with it because sometimes lawyers try to be too smart. They tend to draft their own consolidation provisions into the agreement. And then when you have a fight, you have a conflict between that and what, for example, is said in the SIAC rules. Uh, and that even adds more complexity. So uh, we say, look, take a simple approach, put in a robust arbitration agreement, but choose a reputable institution. And that usually takes care of itself. Yeah. And Sanjeev, if I may come, come to you for your, for your thoughts on that last one. So, so Nitin, most of the points have been covered, I think, and, and I agree with that, uh, having some kind of a common um, umbrella clause or a clause from which you can draw on to and put it into all uh, uh, agreements, the arbitration from where you want to consolidate it is a good idea. I think one thing and, and uh, which, which can also, uh, also be seen is that ultimately arbitration is always the consent of parties. And most of the arbitral or institutional rules will provide that in case parties are consented, then in that particular case, uh, consolidation can happen or joinder can happen. So maybe a clause in the contract which provides for that kind of consent for joinder or consolidation might be a good idea. Uh, it might not be as robust as uh, Mr. Khatan pointed out, having signatures of the parties on a blank sheet of paper in case they're all in their favor. But I think something which has been built in, which gives a kind of a consent that in case of a uh, a joiner or consolidations, the parties would consent under the institutional rule uh, might might be quite helpful and might be quite useful. It needs to be tested, but uh, I think it should work. Yeah. No, thank you, Sanjeev, and, and thank you, everybody. I think the, the the objective of the webinar was was to spend some time on the perils and precautions in complex disputes, uh, and I think we've we've covered a lot of ground uh, in terms of how these complex disputes can play out. Uh, and how, how some of those perils can be avoided uh, at the very inception of, of contract formation. Uh, and also the, the point that it's not always because there are multiple parties and multiple contracts that consolidation is the only and the preferred option. Um, I, I recall when I was a transactional lawyer going to a senior litigator with, with a contract and he said, I, I, I love you transactional lawyers, you draft this complex stuff <laughs> on my table and, and in my courtroom. So, I think, I think the great lesson also is that we, we do need to spend more time, especially in these multiple party, multiple contract kind of situations uh, on the dispute resolution clause. Uh, so that at the end, when parties are actually litigating or arbitrating the dispute, there's less 
less option for a party to game, game the system and, and drag out a proceeding. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you, Shweta and Arun from SEAC and ICA. Uh, I have certainly enjoyed moderating this session and I'm, I'm sure that the par participants and attendees uh, have gone away enriched uh, before, before whatever plans they have later this Friday evening, which I hope is not another webinar or anything legal, in fact. <laughs> and I, hope, I hope all of us have a fun Friday evening. Uh, and, and a wonderful weekend to follow. Uh, and everyone stays safe and well. Again, uh, to my panelists, uh, thank you very much. And we are still under lockdown, so there is no Friday evening anymore. Yeah. Well, Mr. Kaitan, you're speaking from Calcutta, so Delhi is a little better off. <laughs> it's okay, up to 10.30. Yeah. <laughs> you ever had a weekend, you know, or confined to home. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ritin, and thank you, panelists. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, Thank you. Really everybody. wonderful. Yes, I, I love the feedback and the inputs and everything from all the panelists. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.